I want to speak to you this morning about the power or the influence of fathers. Lord, we ask your anointing. We ask that you would enrich your word in us, enrich Christ in us. Praise God. Through your word and your spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. We'll be looking in Genesis chapter 18, if you want to follow. Genesis 18, verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? The Lord in Christ had come with two angels to the plain of Mamre where Abraham was staying at that time to announce the birth of Isaac. And then they're about to leave. The two angels went on to Sodom. The Lord turned back and made this statement. Hallelujah. Praise God. This is what we want, folks. I'm telling you, we want the Lord to do what He does here for us. Now this statement by the Lord shows us that yes, He does hide what He's doing for men. He does. And He can. He's God. How many times have you wondered what is God doing? Sometimes we think it's the devil doing it. Or we think people's doing it. And God uses those venues. The question is, can we persuade the Lord to reveal to us what He's doing so that we can be ready and properly respond to what He's doing, cooperate with what He's doing? But how can we persuade the Lord to reveal what He's doing and why He's doing it and what He's going to do? Those who are allowed to know what God is doing and what He's going to do are a very special and select small number. I'm telling you, it's a very small number. Most people go through life, even people that call themselves Christians don't have a clue what's going on. We read in Amos 3, 7, it says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing but that He reveals His secret to His servants, the prophets. To be able to receive this secret information from the Lord, first we must be able to hear His voice. But He only speaks to His servants. In John 10, 3 and 4, we read that Christ's sheep, or servants, hear His voice. He calls His own sheep by name and leads them out. And when He brings forth His own sheep, He goes before them, and the sheep or His servants follow Him, for they know His voice. This is an awesome thing. Don't you want to be in that place? Christ's sheep, His servants, are those who are doing the will of God. And it's those privileged ones who are allowed to be privy to what God is doing and what He's going to do. To be privy is to be allowed to participate in the knowledge of something private or secret. Now, the Lord gives three reasons why He's going to reveal His secrets to Abraham. And we need to know these. Study them. And align our lives like Abraham's life was aligned. Three reasons. And these reasons, though, are bound up in the will of God. Verse 18. Seeing that are because Abraham. Here's, Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Now, I realize that Israel has been up and down. And it's all according to their obedience to God. Reverence toward God, following God, whether they were up or down. But throughout history, even now, that little place over there is in the news on a regular basis. The first reason uh, we see is that it's the will of God to do something with Abraham that he's not doing with any other person. God is going to cause Abraham's descendants to become a great and mighty nation. So he, this is one of the reasons he's going to reveal his secrets to him. Reveal what he's going to do. This is not a random thing that God was doing. Rather, it was because Abraham sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That is borne out by his actions and his response to the call of God. What does it mean that Abraham sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? 
It meant that Abraham was obedient to the voice of God and his righteousness. He was obedient. Praise God. He was obedient to what God led him to do. He went out not knowing where he was going, but by faith he obeyed God. Then when he got there, by faith he sojourned where God told him to be. It meant that Abraham was a man of faith concerning all the promises that God made to him. Scripture says he waxed strong in faith. Even when things were deteriorating and getting worse, he got stronger in his faith. And no matter how long he had to wait to see the fulfillment of those promises. The second reason was and it is the will of God to bless the nations of the earth or all the peoples of the earth. But what, and it's going to be through this man and his descendants. But what is the blessing that God desires to share with all the people? Here's the problem. We want to decide how God is going to bless us. You hear what I'm saying. And with what God's going to bless us. And we'll tell Him how it needs to be. We tell Him. And get disappointed if it's not what we want. I, I want to say this first. We operate in a materialistic, carnal area. God does not. He's not impressed with any of those things. He operates in a total, completely, totally different area, arena than we do. Now when we hear the word blessing, all sorts of visions of goodies coming down upon us enter into our minds. That car, that house, that job, that whatever, you know. But we must not forget that God's thoughts and ways, including His blessings, are not the same as our thoughts or our ways. For in Isaiah 55 we read, As far as the heavens are above the earth, so are God's ways higher or better than our ways. And His thoughts are higher or better than our thoughts. So we must not assume when God says He's going to bless us that it's going to be like we think it's going to be. I don't know what Abraham thought. But God's blessings for all nations and all people is one thing and one thing only. And that blessing is His Son, Jesus Christ. That is His blessing. And all the others is stuff. And we can live with, with it or without it. You can. People are doing it. But you can't live without His Son. Are we disappointed? Were we expecting material blessings? carnal blessings, perhaps blessings to consume upon our lust, as James 4, 3 says. We know that it is God's will to bless all the nations through His Son because we're, we are instructed, it's written up here behind me, we are instructed to go into all the world and preach the gospel concerning Christ because that's His blessing. But yet you see those going and preaching prosperity and all kinds of things. But it's the gospel concerning Christ. And we're to receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon us to be a witness of that image of Christ unto the uttermost parts of the earth. We're to become what He is. Galatians 3.14 says that the, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. That's everybody that's not a Jew. Through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Receiving the blessing of Abraham does not come through knowing and following Hebrew roots, customs, ceremonies, but it comes through knowing Christ. We cannot know Christ except we receive the promise of the working of the Holy Spirit in us, which is by faith. Acts 3.26 tells us that God raised up His Son, Jesus, and sent Him to bless us and turning away every one of us from our iniquities or our lawlessness. I've talked to people who want to tell me how they're blessed. But it's not this. They're thinking of the carnal material things. They'll point to their car. They'll point to their car. This and that, you know, how, oh, God's blessing me. I tell you what, don't let those material carnal blessings keep you from the real blessing. Don't make that your priority in life. God did not bless Abraham just for his sake alone. But he blesses the people that they might share that blessing and especially the blessing of Christ with other people 
who will or are willing to receive the blessing. Now the blessing of the giving of Christ to a people may not be the blessing you're looking for. But it's the only and the eternal blessing that God has determined to make available to all people. The third reason, verse 19. And this is the Lord speaking. He says, For I know him, Abraham, that he will command his children and his household, everybody that's under him in his, in his whole complex, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring on Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Now, I, I, I want to say this. If we want what God wants for us, then we're going to have to do the will of God. There were promises made to this man, but unless he does the will of God, those promises will not come true for him. Know that. Well, I got a promise from God. He has to do it. There are conditions. Now, the Hebrew word interpreted no, I just need to tell you this, in the King James Version, is unfortunately changed to the word chosen in many modern translations. I'll point this out when I need to. Thus, totally changing the meaning of this scripture. Of, I, I researched this. I know what I'm talking about. Of all the hundreds of times the Hebrew word for no is found in the scriptures, it is used to mean chosen only two times. And this is not one of those times. If, if that's confusion, confusing to you, I'm sorry, but you just need to know that. Because some of you have other translations, and it's, you, you're going to find a different word there besides no. This is the greatest and most important thing that could ever be said of anyone, that God knows them. Matthew 7, 21 this is Christ speaking. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. If we will not seek and do the will of God, if we will not seek and accept the kingdom of God while we're on this earth, then why should we even expect or dream that we're going to enter into the heavenly kingdom of God? Why would you think that? Which we're not seeking now. You know, it's not that we're going to go and do our thing and then someday we'll wake up in heaven. He said, few there be that find it. He said, it's a straight and narrow way. But the way to destruction is broad and many are on it. Verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name have cast out devils and in your name have done many wonderful works. So we see that not everything men do in the name of Jesus Christ is the will of God. I'll tell you it's not. I'm going to build this great big building and call it a church on the best intersection in town. And we're going to be... I, I, there was a pastor one time told me they were planning on building a building. And he, he told me, he said, it's going to be the nicest, most expensive church in town. Doing many things in Jesus' name does not earn, earn a reward. They said we've done many wonderful works. No more than praying prayers with many words. That's Matthew 6, 7. Also we see that we may do good things in Jesus' name and yet not be right with God in our heart and in our living. To do our will and even the smallest thing. Hear that. Even the smallest thing. And to build our kingdom is to forfeit a place in the kingdom of heaven. I want you to hear that this morning. This, is, this whole thing comes down to whose will are we doing? Whose kingdom are we under? Or are we building our own kingdom? Many are operating within the confines of organized religion. Yet they're really building their own kingdom. But you cannot truly be in Christ, in Christ, and build your own kingdom. Verse 23, Jesus goes on to say, And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Our profession of faith in Christ. You know, we were in that jail ministry. Went to prison. I, I did. And uh, it's all about how many professions of Christ 
they can count. Look at this. Our profession of, in, of faith in Christ, you know what, if a dog could talk, you could get him to do that. You can get anybody to say anything if you promise them something. But if, it's, if our profession in Christ is not the important profession, it's not. Our profession is not the important one. His profession of us, whether he will or not, is the important thing. That's what you're aiming for. Make all the professions you want. But will he profess you? We all know that those who have professed Christ, but they failed to do the will of God. I have to admit, as a pastor, I've been fooled many times. I thought, oh, they are going to live for God now. The tears, the jerking, the carrying on, the... and I'm not making light of that, but that's it, it ended right there. Never went through with that. People make promises. There's a few years ago, two different men came to me. I said, this is the church I want to be in. I want you to preach my funeral. Never saw him again. <laughs> Never saw him again. I don't know if this is looking for a preacher to preach her funeral or what, but that's it. Praise God. But we know those people, yet they think that their profession of Christ or their professions will make up for their iniquities. It doesn't. It doesn't. Iniquity is simply lawlessness or failure to do the will of God. Not my will, but your will be done. That's what iniquity is. To be lawless refers to doing the will of God. It refers to not doing the will of God as it's done in heaven. To be lawless means that I am doing my will instead of God's will. Even in the smallest things. The kingdom of God refers to our being totally submitted to the government of God. But working lawlessness or iniquity is to not be subject to the government or laws of God, therefore being lawless. See, Christ laid all this out when they asked Him to teach us to pray. You want to know how to pray? Here's how you pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed or holy be your name. Two things here. Your kingdom come, your government come upon me. Oh, we want God's government in America. Well, what about us? You know, that's where it starts. And the second is, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That's got to be in us. Praise God. That's got to be in every decision, even in our thoughts. The songs we sing. The things we talk about. The places we go. The things we do. The words, depart from me. He said, depart from me are the most terrible words a person will ever hear. But multiplied millions will surely hear those words because they did not do the will of God. They were lawless, full of iniquity. They made choices to do their own will, and so they would surely continue to do so if God, out of His mercy, allowed them to go ahead and enter His heavenly kingdom. They'd, they'd get, if they got into heaven, they'd be doing their own will. They'd be lawless there and would have a problem. Just like He had a problem before with Lucifer had to kick him and a third of the angels out of heaven. If they entered the kingdom of heaven, their lawlessness would surely affect the peace and unity of heaven. And God did not allow that, and He will never allow. Self-willed people. You know, ladies, if you clean your house, you want it to stay clean. Somebody come in throwing stuff and doing, Hey, I clean this house. Well, I'm going to tell you something. God cleaned His house. And he's not letting anybody in there mess it up again. Not me or you or your children or your mom, daddy, whoever. Self-willed people may do their will within organized religion, but they'll never do it in the kingdom of heaven. Simply because they will not be allowed to enter the kingdom. He'll cut that off. And God knows. Just because people are in a church organization does not mean they're in the kingdom of God. Or the kingdom of heaven. Go ahead and have it your way. Do your own thing. Do your own thing. That's what the Lord said there at the last supper to Judas. What you do, do quickly. Go do it. You're not going to like the results. Do it. 
but will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Have we considered what he will answer to us when we request to enter his heavenly kingdom? Have you thought about what he's going to say to you? You know, I sued over a Bible one time. And the man that sued me, he had given me a Bible 10 or 12 years ago. He wanted it back. I couldn't even find the Bible. Didn't want it anyway. And there's reasons. And he stood there in front of that judge and counted off every check he wrote to this church and how much it was for in the day he wrote it. That ain't, that ain't going to work in heaven. <laughs> you just whatever. Get out your financials. To hear God. See here? No, it's not going to work. Nothing's, none of that's going to work. Do we think we can bully our way into heaven? Or buy our way in? Or sweet talk our way in? The one requirement for entering the kingdom of heaven will be that Christ knows us. That's it. And he only knows those who do the will of his Father in heaven, no matter the good deeds we've done in his name. Therefore, we see why Abraham has achieved with God a very good standing. I know him. I know him. Praise God. This good ground of being known by God was not an accident, nor was it automatic. And it wasn't because Abraham made a profession someday when he was eight years old or something. There's a price to pay to achieve this good standing with Christ. What is the price? It's to deny ourselves, our will, take up our cross daily and follow him. Abraham was a godly father. We're talking about the power or influence of fathers. Now, I want to speak to you about one godly father and two, if I, if I can get to them, two ungodly fathers. Genesis 18, 19. We're moving on down here. He said, For I know him that he will command his children's household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he spoken of him. If we desire to be a godly father or parent, let us observe and learn from one that God identifies to be a godly father. And Abraham was a godly father. Abraham was a father. I want to stop and say this. Disclaimer, so to speak. I look back and wish I had changed some, could change some things I did as a father. And any father in here probably, if you don't say it now, you'll say it later. I wish, but you can't. Praise God. But you can ask forgiveness, first of God, because it's against God that we've sinned. Abraham was a father that pleased God. Why? Because he would command his children and his household to follow him, his servants, all those under him, as he followed the Lord. Notice Abraham was not a godly father because he was their best friend, because he made good money so they had the latest fashion of shoes and clothes, or because he bought them the latest forms of entertainment. It was not because Abraham saw to it that they received the best education, and he surely did not allow the Egyptians to educate his children or his household. We could go on and on with this. You may say that times have changed, and they have. But really, the scripture says there's nothing new under the sun. But whatever we think, God has not changed. Let me stop. I need to stop and say this. If your father wasn't everything you wished he'd have been or thought he should be, you have to forgive him. I had to forgive my father. I made a decision to forgive him. You have to. And let me tell you, if you won't forgive your father, you're going to have some children that won't forgive you. And you're going to make mistakes that need to be forgiven. God has not changed, nor has he changed his principles. It's still God that we must please regardless of how the world goes. Well, they're doing this and they're doing that. Kid, your kids will come tell you. Well, all my friends are doing it. So? 
Is God doing it? Has he changed? Just in case men want to have a different opinion on how Abraham was to raise his children, the Lord makes it very unequivocally plain. They must be commanded to keep the way of the Lord or commanded to do the will of God. He said, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him or to follow after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring on Abraham that which was spoken of him. I, I want to say this as, to fathers, or to any parent that is serving God in the capacity of a father to a child, any person. You know, the Apostle Paul said, you have many teachers, but you have not many fathers. The Apostle Paul, though he bore no children that we know of, was a father to many. A true father. Abraham was not to ask them what they liked. Or what they wanted. Or how they felt about things. Rather he was to command them to walk in the ways of the Lord. Some parents are afraid of the word command. But why are we afraid to do what God instructs us to do? Who are we afraid of? What are we afraid of? In today's culture, children are not only allowed to express their opinions, but they're allowed to guide their own lives. This is Antichrist. Proverbs 29, 15, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. And, not, and certainly the father too. This is what this nation has come to. Parents brought to shame. Great and grievous shame. And sometimes you wonder how they bear that shame. Some of them try to do it by defending their child's wrong behavior. Somebody did something, you know, pointing fingers, blaming. This is what this nation has come to. Children left to do what their self and their flesh nature want to do. Or what the public schools command them to do it. And if you don't think they're not doing it, when they're showing videos and having sex education and the parents are not even allowed to know what it is or to even take their, opt their children out of it. We're coming to where the public schools completely are going to control children. Or what entertainment industry commands them to do. You better know they're doing it. Or what their friends command them to do. Do you know who your children's friends are? What they're like? What, what their morals are? Or what the political... And don't expect them to tell you the truth. Or what the political forces command them to do. We've got, we've got political forces now. Getting kids out of school and the schools are cooperating with it. To protest and to march. Don't think for a minute that those entities are not commanding the children of this nation, because they are. I'll tell you, if you're a parent, serving as a parent, you got a lot against you. While Christian parents are reluctant to command their children to follow them as they follow the Lord, this carnal world and the devil has stepped in and taken that place of commanding. But it's to the very destruction not only of children, but the destruction of the family and this nation. I'll tell you it is. And we're going to see it. Perhaps the reason most Christian parents are reluctant to command their children to follow them as they follow the Lord is because the parents are not following the Lord. They're not submitted to the kingdom of God themselves and they're not doing the will of God. And they know they're not. Most Christian parents know nothing about the will of God. And therefore, how can they command their children to do the will of God? There is a remedy for those who do not know the will of God, for all of us. And I don't know the will of God in everything. I certainly don't. But there's a remedy. Do what Christ told us to do and pray for God's kingdom to come and His will to be done in earth as it is in heaven. When you don't know, pray that way and pray sincerely with no agenda of your own. It's easier to lead children to themselves. 
a child left to themselves, or to the TV, or to video games, or to commands of the public schools, or their friends, or Facebook. But in the end, it will produce great sorrow and grief. Proverbs 22, 6, train up or command a child in the way he should go when he's old, he will not depart from it. There's a war going on to control the church, families, and this nation. You know there is. Never like we've, we've never seen it like this before. It's being fought, fought through the commanding or controlling of the youth of this nation. They're starting with them in kindergarten, folks, teaching them it's all right to do some of these things. They've been at it a long time. They have changed. And then they get into college and it even gets rougher. The problem is children don't have the wisdom to make wise decisions for themselves. And they're under peer pressure in those institutions. You understand that? There are children that are being attacked for taking a stand for what's right. That's in the news. And it's... Even teenagers don't know. They think they do. God knows this and the devil knows this. Proverbs 10, 21, The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for want of wisdom. Shouldn't the righteous be commanding children instead of what we're witnessing today? I want to say, where is the church in all of this? In commanding his children to do justice and judgment, Abraham, it is meant that Abraham would command them to not be lawless concerning the law of God, but to do the will of God in all things. And just in, I'm, I want to put that in just in case someone thinks it's some kind of carnal justice and judgment. It all has to do with the will of God, the law of God. Look at the things Abraham did concerning his children and his household versus what parents are doing and, and allowing today. If you have to get your Bible out and read that man, what that man did. What must a godly parent do? What must they command their children to do? Deuteronomy 6, 7. And you shall teach them, that's your children, the ways of the Lord diligently. Diligently. I tell you, some parents were as diligent about this as they are about making sure their kids are in sports or in this or that or looking at their grades. I tell you what, you can go to heaven without a high school edu diploma or education. Do you know that? You sure can. You can go to heaven without a lot of things that this world is saying we have to have now. There are those religions that totally, and I'm not advocating this, but I'm saying you do what God tells you to do, that totally segregate their children from the world. And you watch most of those children stick with what they've been taught. But when we have the mixture, and we, here's, here's the church, maybe has the child for an hour, most churches for an hour, a week. And you look at how long the public school has them, how long TV has them, video games, all these things, what chance do they have to hear truth and to have it implanted in them? One of the families that I respected the most growing up had a son. And, and I, I would say on, from the outward the most spiritual in the lady in the church and yet they pressured their son and worked to get him into sports. Why? Why? I, I, I need to be, I need to stop. I can say a lot of things about I, I, over the years, examples I could stand here and tell you. Praise God. Teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise up. Now, I, I know this. There's not At that point, there wasn't near the competition in the home that there is now. You know what I'm talking about through the media, entertainment and all that. But listen, parents, you can stop a lot of that. And you should. You don't have to do that. 
A hundred years ago, they wouldn't know what we're talking about now. But, but, but children turned out different then. Psalm 78, 4. We will not hide from them from our children. This is talking about the things God's done. Show unto the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. For He has established a testimony in Jacob, that's Israel, and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generations to come might know them, even the children which should still be born, yet to be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. That's the way God expects this to be. I teach my children, they teach their children, their children teach their children. Is this happening in your family? Are your children and grandchildren being taught the ways of the Lord? Are they, is, is God even on equal footing time-wise in your home with all the rest of this stuff? Don't leave this responsibility to the church for an hour a week. We're commanded to do this in our homes and wherever we are with our children and grandchildren. Joshua 4, 5, And Joshua said to them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take every man a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. Now they were at the Jordan River getting ready to go into that land that God promised them. After 40 years of wandering in that wilderness and God working a work, all the ones that refused to go in in, in Numbers chapter 14 are dead now. The, uh, 20 years of age or older. They're all dead now. This is a new young group that's a different from their parents because their parents got out of Egypt but Egypt never got out of them. And they're going to they're fixing to cross and it's at it's at flood stage. And what are how they going to get across? And he said, You take the ark first, and those waters are going to open. And they did. The Ark of the Covenant. He said that this may be as and now when you go through, one man from every of the twelve tribes is to get a stone and carry it on his shoulder, carry it out of the bottom the bed of that sea, of that, of that river. That this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What do you mean by these stones? Then shall you answer them and say that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Verse 21, And he spoke to the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come in the future, saying, What mean these stones? Then shall you let, let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land, for the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we were gone over. I, what is this? Do we have any signs, any answers to prayer that we can show to our children and grandchildren? Can we point to this and say, God did this. God provided this. Children need to hear that. Or they'll grow up thinking, God, God doesn't answer prayer. Where is God? He's off somewhere doing his thing. That's all I'm going to say about that part. Now, ungodly fathers. 1 Samuel 2.12 Now the sons of Eli, the priests, were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. They did not know the Lord. Why didn't these sons know the Lord? This fault has to be traced back to their father, the priest. Just because he's a priest, just because you're a pastor, doesn't mean your children are going to know the Lord. The fault has to be because their father did not command them to walk in the ways of the Lord. Can't be anything else. Why didn't these sons know the Lord? The Apostle Paul said this concerning his desire to know the Lord. He said that I might know him. He's willing to, to, to lose everything and count it all as garbage that he might know the Lord. But these sons are different. They don't care whether they know the Lord or not. Verse 22, now Eli was very old. He heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they were sleeping with the women who served at the entrance to the tabernacle of meeting. 
And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. No, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress. If any man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they listen not to the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. Verse 27, There came a man of God to Eli, this is a prophet, and said to Eli, Thus says the Lord, Did I plainly appear to your, your house or your family of your father, the tribe of Levi, when you were yet in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did not I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer on my altar, to burn in, incense, to wear the ephod before me? And did I not give to the house or family of your father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Why kick you at or despise my sacrifice and my offerings? What were they doing? These two sons were shoving people out. See, they brought their sacrifices, and was, which was meat and other things. And, and what they brought was to be food for the priest and his family. But what was they were taking what belonged to the Lord, shoving people out, took it. You can read about it. They took hooks and, and pulled that out for their own selves. Totally dis, disrespecting the Lord and His sacrifice. Why do you kick at or despise my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my habitation? This is the Lord speaking through this prophet. And honor your sons above me to make yourselves fat with the most chief of all the offerings of, of Israel, my people. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that your house, the house of your father, should walk before me forever. But now, the Lord said, be it far from me. For them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off your armor, your strength, and the armor strength of your father's house. There shall not be an old man in your house or your family. You shall see, you shall see an enemy in my habitation. That means in distress you shall look with envious eyes, upon all the prosperity which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in your house or family any more. And the man or sons of yours whom I shall cut off from my altar shall, shall be to consume or weep your eyes and to grieve your heart. And all the increase or sons of your house, your family, shall die in the flower or youth of their age. And this shall be a sign to you, Eli, that shall come upon your two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas, and one day... They shall die, both of them. And I will raise up to me a faithful priest, that will be Samuel, that will do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind. Or in other words, he'll do my will. And I will build him a sure house or family line, and he shall walk before my anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left in your house, your family, now listen to this, shall come and crouch or bow down to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, I pray you, into one of the priest's offices, or give me a job that I might eat a piece of bread. You know, a few years ago I had a dream of some people that, you can think whatever you want to think of this, but I'm going to tell you. And they were here, and they left, and it wasn't good. And I had a dream where they stood before me, and the wife said to me, Do you just have a, a, a rag that I can clean with? Now they're very prosperous right now, extremely prosperous. And that's and when I read this, it just I never noticed it before, I'll be honest. But he said they're gonna come. Your 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 offspring are gonna come before this godly lineage and beg for a job so they can have something to eat. 1 Samuel 3.11 And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that hears it shall tingle or shudder. In that day I will perform, it against, perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his family or his sons. When I begin, I shall also make an end. God never starts something he does not end. One way or another, depending at times upon the repentance of men. Verse 13, For I have told him that I will judge his house, his sons, forever for the iniquity or lawlessness, which he knows. He knows it. Eli knows. 
because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. He did not restrain them. You know, you see this everywhere now. Parents, no restraining of their children whatsoever. Well, we don't want to thwart them. We don't want to give them a complex. We don't want to something. I don't know. That's exactly the opposite of what God said to do. If they won't like me. Well, let me tell you something. You don't restrain, they'll grow up and they sure won't like you. They'll disrespect you. They'll spit on you. Especially when you can't any longer give them what they want. But you, you restrain them in a godly way and you'll have them as your children. With respect. That's in most cases. Most cases. I know our children grow up they become adults to make their own choices. Eli was warned, yet he did not stop his sons. Therefore, they brought a curse upon themselves and their sons. Verse 14, And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity or lawlessness of Eli's house, his sons, shall not be purged with sacrifices nor offerings forever. There are sins that cannot be and will not be forgiven. Esau sought a place of repentance with tears, but he found no place of repentance because God did not grant repentance to him. Repentance has to be granted by God. It's at his sole pleasure, not ours. We cannot just pray a prayer of repentance and then claim or declare that we are forgiven. Now you know what happened. There was a war. They took the Ark of the Covenant out there and Hophni and Phoenicia went with it. And they were defeated and the Ark was was captured. A messenger came back and told what had happened. When Eli sitting on, he's about 98 years old now, he's a heavy man, he's sitting on a chair by the entrance into the, to the tabernacle. When he hears about the Ark of the Covenant, he falls over, breaks his neck and dies. Then his daughter-in-law, who's having a child by one of these two sons, she hears what happens goes into labor, and dies. The boy is born. His name, she named him. She named him before she died, Ichabod, meaning the glory of the Lord has departed from Israel. It's a sad day. I'm telling you, it's a sad day, folks. It's a sad day. You look what this man did to his family, not even counting the nation, because he would not Restrain his sons. Look at the carnage he brought upon them. It's his fault. He can't blame anybody else. It's his fault. God laid it squarely at his feet. You did not restrain them. I'm, I'm about finished here. I'm one more, and this is shorter. Aaron and his two sons, two oldest sons. Leviticus 10.1. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered strange or unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them or burned them to death, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and to Ithmar, the other two sons, his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest you die lest wrath come upon all the people. But let your brothers, the whole house of Israel, mourn the burning which the Lord has kindled. What is he saying? He's saying to Aaron and his other two sons, don't you even act like you don't agree with what God's done. Don't you, don't you even act like it. You agree with what God has done. Hear me, folks. Things may come to you or to your family. God may do some things in judgment. Don't you act like God's at fault. God's a culprit. God's unfair. Don't you act that way. That's what he's saying. Or you'll die. And you'll affect the whole nation. That's a principle of God. And you shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation lest you die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. He said, touch not mine anointing, neither do my prophets any harm. But look at this. 
as being anointed of God, we have responsibilities. You understand that? Oh, I'm anointed. I can do what I want to, say what I want to, go. No, you can't. No, you can't. He said, be, don't be teachers of many. You'll come under more condemnation. So what's he saying? Be careful about wanting the anointing, desiring the anointing, asking for the anointing. Be careful. Aaron was not always a godly father. He wasn't. We're talking about the power of a father, the influence of a father. For being com complicit, a complicit person, obliging person, we see other instances, his involvement in the golden calf, which he made, and his involvement with his sister Miriam's attack on Moses are examples. They're examples, and so we see. We can see there what happened and why these two sons got out of line. They, got a they have a father who doesn't really walk the line with God. He's, he's fudging on things. He's doing things. They know that. And so they do too. Would you stand with me, please? I, I really have no idea why I preach this except God gave it to me. I'm not aiming at anyone. I promise you that. If I was going to aim it at someone, I'd aim it at myself. And I do. How can this turn around? I don't know. God will have to show you. But God will. And if things have got out of order, out of line with your descendants or whoever God's given you to raise... If they've got out of line, ask God to help you. It may have to be one step at a time, one thing at a time. Just like the children of Israel conquering the promised land, one place at a time, one group at a time. But God can do it. And if, you, if you'll work with Him and follow His leadership, you'll like the end result. And so will your descendants. Praise God. Amen. Oh, glory to God. Lord, we thank You. Help us to know, Lord, we're not as smart as we think we are. We're not as powerful as we think we are. We're not really in charge of anything. Forgive us, Lord, forgive us. Always, Lord, room for repentance, always, in all things. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We praise you. We praise you, oh God. We praise you. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to fix whatever we can fix with your help, your direction, your guidance, your authority. Praise God. Help us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Would you come and stand? We'll pray for you this morning. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus.